Hello everyone. So a few videos ago, we were studying this system over here, which is a pendulum with a support which is free to slide horizontally. And what we were doing in that video was looking at small oscillations of the system. What I'd like to do this time is revisit the same system, but remove the assumption that it's performing small oscillations and see what we can learn um, about the general motion um, of this pendulum. Now we're not going to be able to come up with um, fully general expressions for the generalized coordinates x and theta as a function of time. However, it turns out that we can uh, learn something about the trajectory that the bob of the pendulum follows. Now for this video, our starting point is going to be the Lagrangian that I've already written out here. Um, if you want to see where that comes from, then take a look at that other video that I was mentioning, but we're going to take it as a given for now. And the first thing I want to point out about this Lagrangian is that Although in principle, it could depend on the generalized coordinates and their time derivatives, x theta, x dot, and theta dot. If you inspect this thing, you'll see that there is in fact um, no x dependence. That's going to be a key point for our video. So I'm just going to make a note of that there. The implication of that can be seen from the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation for x, um, which is going to say that d by dt of the partial derivative of L with respect to x dot is the partial derivative of L with respect to x, but we've just said it doesn't depend on x, so that's zero. Now at this point there are really two ways to proceed. Either you do what we did last time and just do the time derivative and you end up with a second order um, differential equation, uh, or you directly integrate both sides with respect to time. Um, the left hand side is very easy to integrate because it's just a derivative and integrating with respect to time undoes the derivative and you just get um, dl by dx dot. And if you just integrate zero, you just get a constant. Now I'm going to call that constant um, p, spell out explicitly the fact that it's constant. Um, it's called p because it's the momentum conjugate to the x coordinate. In other words, it is just um, the momentum in the x direction. This is in fact an application of Noether's theorem, which says that when there's a symmetry, um, in other words, when your Lagrangian doesn't depend on one of the generalized coordinates, then the associated um, conjugate momentum is a conserved quantity. Right, so where are we going with this? Well, let's just figure out what dl by dx dot is. Um, differentiate your Lagrangian with respect to x dot. Uh, your first term is going to become m1 plus m2 times x dot. Second term is going to become m2l uh, theta dot cos theta, the other terms don't depend on x dot, so that stuff is supposed to be equal to the constant p. Now this equation can actually be integrated pretty easily because both terms just contain a first order time derivative. So if we integrate um, the previous line with respect to time, the first term, you just get rid of the time derivative, so it becomes m1 plus m2x. Um, the second term is less complicated than it looks uh, because if we try to integrate theta dot cos theta with respect to time, remember that theta dot is d theta by dt, which means that theta dot dt is the same as d theta, right? So this is the same as the integral of cos theta with respect to theta, um, and that's just sine theta, right? So we go to plus uh, m2l sine theta. The right-hand side is going to be our constant p times t plus some other constant, constant of integration, let's just call it c. So what does this imply about how the bob of the pendulum is moving? Well, firstly, let me just point out that the Cartesian coordinates of the pendulum bob um, measured relative to some origin, which we're going to put up there. And the x coordinate is, um, I'm calling this capital X, by the way, to distinguish it from the generalized coordinate x, which is the displacement of the support of the pendulum. Um, but your, your x coordinate, uh, of the pendulum bob is given by x plus this um, little bit uh, at the bottom, which is L sine theta from trigonometry. So it's x plus L sine theta. And similarly, your y coordinate of the pendulum bob is gonna be just minus L cos theta, minus because we're defining y to be up, um, sort of increasing in the vertical direction as is conventional. Now notice in particular that the uh, Cartesian coordinate capital X the defining equation for that, and the uh, integrated equation of motion um, that we just derived, both directly link uh, small x and theta. And so we could combine those to eliminate one of those parameters. I'm going to choose to eliminate little x. 
let's go ahead and do that. Um, basically, you want to rearrange this equation up there and substitute the resulting expression for x in place of that x um, in the Cartesian uh, coordinate definition. Um, and then straightforwardly from, uh, from that long equation, little x is pt plus c minus m2 l sine theta, then you're going to have to divide everything by m1 plus m2, and then you've got your plus l sine theta, All right, that's still there, nothing's happened to that. Um, and then we can regroup the terms a little bit um, into a theta dependent bit and a non theta dependent bit. So the non theta dependent bit will just be pt plus c over m1 plus m2. Um, then, okay, so these are both l sine theta terms. If you think of this as m m1 plus m2 over m1 plus m2 times l sine theta, and then you combine that with all of this stuff, you're just going to be left with m1 over m1 plus m2 uh, times l sine theta. So let's write that down, plus m1 over uh, m1 plus m2 l sine theta. So this is interesting because now we've eliminated the, the dependence of big X on little x, right? We've expressed big X in terms of only theta. Okay, there's some explicit time uh, dependence in there as well, but in terms of the generalized coordinates, big X now depends um, explicitly only on theta. And the same can be said for y, right? That was that was true from the start, y is just minus L cos theta. So you could combine the equation that we've just got for capital X with the equation for capital Y to eliminate theta and thus come up with a Cartesian equation that defines the path that the Bob traces out. Um, for convenience, I'm just going to define uh, some other parameters. Let's call this um, algebraic fraction alpha. And remember that depends on time linearly. And let's call the prefactor of sine theta, including that L there, let's just call that um, beta, uh, which is not dependent on time. Now, because x depends on sine theta, while y depends on cos theta, you can use the identity sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is one um, to eliminate theta. So if you rearrange the equation for x for sine theta, um, using those um, parameters that I defined for convenience, uh, well, sine theta is just big X minus um, alpha of t divided by beta. Um, we're going to square that because we're going to use the trig identity I mentioned earlier. Um, what about cos theta? Well, cos theta is just y over minus L, but because we're going to square it, the minus sign doesn't really matter. So I'm going to say plus y over L uh, all squared. That's equal to one. This looks very much like the Cartesian equation um, of an ellipse, which is usually x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is one where a and b are the semi-major and semi-minor uh, axes of the ellipse, except there's this offset alpha of t. And so you can kind of think of this path as being like an ellipse whose center um, is constantly moving to the right at a linear rate um, with time. And so it'll trace out a curve which looks something like a cycloid. I'm not quite sure if there is a, a technical name for this exact kind of curve, but it kind of um, looks a little bit like a cycloid. So let's now consider a specific a uh, simpler case to see if we can get any more insight into um, why uh, our solution has this particular form. Um, let's start by supposing that um, the constant capital P is zero. Remember, um, this alpha here depends on P because alpha was defined as that, um, that fraction. And you could ensure that P was zero just through suitable initial conditions. P is the momentum, the overall momentum in the X direction, right? So you could, for example, um, arrange it so that you give the support of the pendulum a push to the right. And uh, at the same time, you give the pendulum's bob a push to the left. And which one's bigger will depend on the parameter of the system, which one is heavier. But in principle, there's nothing to say that you can't um, you know, design it so that you're X momentum is zero. We can go even further and uh, suppose that there are certain uh, initial conditions on the uh, generalized coordinates. Let's say X at time zero and theta at time zero are both zero. In other words, the system starts with the, um, the support of the pendulum at the origin of the coordinate system and the bob hanging just vertically downwards. From this equation up at the top here, plug in zero for both X and theta and zero for p, and you conclude um, that uh, 
c should also be zero and that makes uh, our uh, trajectory equation simplify very nicely essentially because if p and c are both zero then alpha is also zero and so you get um, the very nice looking equation x over uh, beta squared plus y over l squared um, is one and then you can directly read off the semi-major and semi-minor um, axes of the resulting ellipse so let's write those down the semi-minor axis um, is going to be this beta um, which was defined as m1 l over m1 plus m2 let's write it down so m1 over m1 plus m2 times l how do we know that's the semi-minor axis rather than the semi-major axis well um, let me just write down semi-major axis and then I'll explain why. It's because if you look at the y term, it's y over l squared. Um, so the, the length scale associated with the y direction is just l, right? That doesn't depend on the masses, that's just l. And if you think about it, purely algebraically, um, the ratio m1 over m1 plus m2, um, if m1 and m2 are both positive, it's always going to be less than 1. Therefore, this quantity is always less than this quantity. And so it is the um, uh, the axis in the x direction, which is the, the minor axis. Now, do these parameters actually make physical sense? Well, let's first think about the semi-major axis. Um, in other words, the half um, length of the ellipse in the vertical direction being L. That makes a lot of sense because um, the uh, rod of the pendulum has a fixed length L. So the pendulum, when it's hanging directly below the support, has to be a distance of L below. And when it's directly above the support, it also has to be a distance of L directly above. In other words, the maximum Y coordinate is L and the minimum Y coordinate is minus L. So that explains why our semi-major axis has come out to be L. Now intuitively, the semi-minor axis, um, in other words, the uh, length of the ellipse in the X direction being smaller than the length in the Y direction also makes physical sense because what's happening is, um, it, well, first consider what would happen if we had a fixed support then, uh, of course, your pendulum bob would just move along an arc of a circle. Um, so your pendulum is sort of trying to do this. But remember we said that um, the, uh, the overall momentum of the system is zero. So now let's allow the pendulum to slide. If your pendulum bob is trying to move to the right, then the pendulum support will correspondingly move to the left. And that leftwards motion of the support is going to tend to pull the bob further to the left than it would have been uh, if the support were not free to move. And so it's like you've taken a, a circle and squashed it along the x direction because you're allowing that support to slide over to the left. Of course, it's always good to consider limiting cases. In particular here, the easier thing to do is think about what happens if m1 is much bigger than m2. In that case, the denominator is basically just m1 and m1 over m1 is 1, and so the semi-minor axis becomes L then you have a circle because the semi-minor and semi-major axes are both L and you've recovered the solution, um, the kind of obvious fact that a, a pendulum with a fixed support will just move in a circle. Anyway, I think that's all I have to say about this system for the time being. So thank you for watching.